suspect, and I, I think I was told that, that they did have somebody scheduled for August, but they <laughs> failed to come forward. <laughs> so so I'm on the backup team today, but that's all right. Um, my wife just pointed out that this is not a talk I have ever done, and yet it's something that I've been collecting information on for a long, long time. And it's um, probably as close as I get to uh, any kind of uh, pottery speciality, uh, and that's because it's family, as is a lot of the crowd here today. I can see at least four people who are direct descendants of Stephen Moore. Um, McDevitt and Moore was one of the smaller potteries in East Liverpool uh, during its heyday as the pottery capital of the United States. Um, and they operated basically for a period of about 30 years. Never a large concern. Um, by the uh, mid-1870s, there was a newspaper article that discussed the various potteries that were in effect at, or in operation at that time, and that article indicated that McDevitt and Moore had about 20 employees. Uh, a later article from the late 1880s um, indicated, and of course this was in conjunction with a fire, uh, which, which seems to be the problem for a lot of potteries, certainly McDevitt and Moore, at that time they had 50 employees, so it was never anything to the, uh, to the extent of uh, KT and K or, or Homer Laughlin or any of the other giants of the industry. But it was a, a kind of a neat little operation, if I can say, say that, being a descendant. Um, it was gone long before I was ever thought of, and uh, it's just one of those things that um, I, I told somebody not too long ago that I, I feel that I am more of a clearinghouse uh, than a historian, because people, people call me and, and tell me stuff and, and give stuff uh, to me or to the historical society that I find of interest and I just kind of uh, keep it all intact. Uh, same thing with McDevitt and Moore. I, I knew that, uh, that we were related and therefore I, I had some interest in it. Actually, one of the main reasons that I became interested in local history is when I was uh, taken to Riverview Cemetery as a very young child and shown the uh, grave marker for Stephen Moore, which was indicated he had been a Civil War veteran, which at age five, that was enough to push me over the edge. That, that and a trip to Gettysburg ruined me for life. So you, and you all have to face the consequences of that. But uh, the combination of the Civil War veteran, the pottery, and the fact that, uh, that he was one of the English immigrants that, uh, that tended to populate East Liverpool after the Bennetts started our first pottery. And what, what I think is kind of interesting about the McDevitt and Moore operation is that both of the main characters who ended up running the pottery for the better part of 30 years would have never, and I repeat, never have gotten to the point of owning their own pottery had they stayed in Europe. Um, in fact, Stephen Moore, uh, born in 1834 uh, in Burslem, Staffordshire, um, was a member of a, a pottery working family. Uh, in the census records uh, for 1841, of course, his father was, was a potter, and some of the older children were already working in the potteries. They hadn't even achieved double-digit age, and yet they were working in the potteries. Um, in 1851, uh, Stephen, who was just barely 16 years old at the time, uh, was listed on the English census for that year as being a slip maker. And again, I, I, I believe, I could be wrong, that, that this is kind of a, a typical uh, occurrence for those potters that came to East Liverpool. They started in one area and they, they moved to other areas uh, in, within the pottery industry, I mean, in the industry itself, not a geographic location, so that a lot of them became uh, what I refer to as practical potters. They knew a little bit about everything. They didn't just make slip, they didn't just make glaze, they knew how to fire the ware, they knew how to mix the clay, they knew, some of them knew how to decorate afterwards. And I think a lot of that uh, carries over with a, a firm like McDevitt and Moore. Now, not to give Mr. McDevitt the short uh, attention uh, just because he's not r related to me, 
a similar story, except that he was born in Ireland, in Donegal. And uh, according to some of the information I've found on him, um, at age 12, he was apprenticed to a pottery in Scotland. And he spent six years uh, completing his apprenticeship, after which he got out of the United Kingdom and, and came to the United States. Uh, traveled around a bit before he ended up in East Liverpool. But he was here by the late 1850s, which coincidentally is almost exactly when Stephen Moore arrived, because he was here in time uh, for the 1860 census that took place in East Liverpool and everywhere in Ohio. Uh, so he was a resident at that time, and the youngest of his children had been born in Ohio. So we know that he got here roughly 1858. There were some confusing things about uh, well, about the whole operation, um, McDevitt was an Irish Catholic. Uh, Moore was, I don't know how good a Protestant he was, but he was a, a Protestant uh, Englishman. And yet they, they managed to keep it together for the better part of 30 years without committing violence upon one another. Um, when the firm first started in the years shortly after the Civil War, it was started as a stock company. And then uh, as the time ran on, there were just constant changes in uh, ownership and management, like a lot of the potteries, if you read these things. And I, I recommend anybody that's interested in this, the uh, manuscript called uh, Early Clay Industries of the uh, Upper Ohio Valley. That'll get you... Uh, Donna and I agree that it's a bestseller, but no one else would. Uh, it's really a, a neat book. It was written by a guy in uh, the night, early 1920s, a guy named Calhoun, whose father had been the head engineer for kt and &K, and he was involved primarily in the West End pottery. Um, and, and it's just kind of a little chatty history about what went on in all the different firms, not just the potteries, but the brickyards, the uh, decorating shops, the you name it. And, and he certainly had some details about McDevitt and Moore. And in fact, um, Moore came in a couple years after the pottery started, and he and McDevitt managed to hold out longer than anyone else. So they were in, in total charge of the operation by the, let's say, by 1874. And they, they continued that uh, almost until 1900. Well, almost. Uh, McDevitt died in 1896, and Stephen Moore died in September of 1899, at which time the, his pottery was closed. Um, one of the things about uh, Stephen that, that I was curious about and none of the family could answer for me is if he was from England, if he was here in time for the American Civil War, if he was in it, how in God's name did he end up in the 34th New Jersey Infantry, which is what it says on his, or did say on his stone until somebody broke the stone off, and then I just checked on it yesterday, it's now gone. I'll have to ask somebody at Riverview if it's been tossed out. I hope to get it replaced. But it just seemed odd to me. Um, my, my late grandmother always said, well, he must have been a substitute. Uh, how she found out about substitutes, I wouldn't know, but, but that was her belief. And I think the truth of the matter is, um, when the Civil War started, the first thing that happened is that tra traffic up and down the Ohio River and from there to the Mississippi just absolutely dried up because there were no markets. There was a war going on so that the ability to market ware to the southern states, which was a big part of, of the local pottery industry, uh, just was not available. And there were hard times uh, in East Liverpool. Some of the letters that exist that are not just connected with this pottery, but with all the potteries indicate that um, to the extent that uh, things were ongoing, they were ongoing on a low level. And uh, at some point, uh, I believe Stephen Moore and others left East Liverpool and went to that garden spot uh, on the East Coast, Trenton, New Jersey, which uh, largely because of this institution I now know was the second largest 
pottery town in the United States. And because they were not quite uh, dependent upon river transportation for their wares, they uh, weren't hit quite as hard by the, the, uh, the, the effects of the American Civil War as far as shutting down pottery. So Stephen was no doubt working there um, and uh, ended up joining a, a New Jersey regiment for the period of one year. He didn't enlist until 1864, and, and it was to be a one-year term. Um, I thought it was interesting that uh, I found a roster of the company that he was in, in that regiment, and the commanding captain of Company I was a, a fellow named Taylor, which just happens to be the name of uh, Stephen Moore's mother. So whether or not that was other family members who had stayed in Trenton and perhaps uh, said, you know, come on over and work here, or whatever, but, it, but he, did, uh, he did go off to war. Now, can I relay any, any heroic tales of his service? No. Um, by the time he was in the Civil War, the, uh, most of the major campaigns were well underway or finished, and the 34th New Jersey was sent uh, into the, the Deep South um, where they uh, uh, trying to think of the name of the town. Not Biloxi, but uh, one of the southern sea forts on, on the Gulf, they were engaged in the siege of Confederate fortifications there. And uh, I did find one obscure reference in the official records of the Civil War that said that the 34th New Jersey made a heroic charge. And then it says, after the other regiments had driven everyone away. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that was heroic, but uh, uh, that's, that's what it said. Stephen was discharged uh, after, shortly after the end of the war, before his one-year term was up, and he came back to East Liverpool. So I, to my knowledge, there was never any, uh, any additional connection with the state of New Jersey. Um, they... Uh, you know, there, there are no records to be had of, of uh, McDevitt and Moore other than a few things that family members may have retained. Uh, and, and another interesting thing to me at least about McDevitt and Moore is that they were never known to mark any of their wear, either with, with an incised mark or with a decal or with anything at all. Whether that means they just didn't need to or weren't that proud of their production, or <laughs> what. But we have noticed, we, I'm, I'm including myself in this discovery, although my part in it was pretty small, um, in talking to Bill and Donna, and to a lesser extent, uh, Sarah uh, Vaudry Hendrickson, uh, we got to looking at, at various known or suspected pieces of McDevitt and more wear. And, uh, you know, since it's not marked, you don't really know if it was made there. They were known to make uh, Rockingham, Yellowware, and for a brief period of time, they made Majolica, which is a tin-glazed earthenware that, uh, that's gonna be out in a, a major exhibit and a book and all that sort of thing here sometime next year. But one thing, I think Bill and Donna noticed this first, when they were photographing all the known examples of McDevitt and Moore wear that have survived, they found out that most of it is chipped, <laughs> which may mean something or other. But um, wherever it's chipped or wherever the glaze didn't cover it, it is red. It is a red, or fire's red, the clay. And, and McDevitt and Moore were kind of unusual in that they mined all their own clay on site. In fact, if you want to see the clay that they mined, all you have to do is drive out Route 11, and you'll see where the hillside has let go again. And that's because it is a clay bank. And that, that is underway now. They're going to be uh, scaling back on the... Uh, the hillside to try to stop the, uh, the slides from taking place. And in fact, um, they mined their clay up on top of the hill there. They also mined their own coal nearby. So, and there was water flowing by in Carpenter's Run. So they had pretty much everything they needed to make the pottery. 
The thing they didn't have were decent roads to get it down to the Broadway Wharf. They had to, to go in, you know, dirt roads, which Dresden was dirt for many, many years, and certainly throughout the time that McDevitt and Moore operated. <coughs> Um, and, and it was apparently a nightmare for them to, to get anything off to market. One of the optimistic things in the 1876 news article says that, you know, that is a problem. They know it's a problem. However, when the new East Liverpool to Cleveland Railroad goes up uh, the valley there, they will be, you know, in a perfect position. Well, that railroad never, never came to fruition, so uh, it was a problem all their operating lives. One of the things that, there are a few representations of the pottery. Uh, now, for example, this one is wildly over-optimistic uh, because it shows this, this huge U-shaped building with another large building in the uh, middle. And... Um, uh, it, it wasn't like that, folks. The photographs, these lie, but the photographs don't. Um, they never had quite that big an operation. But one thing that does appear in this drawing, and uh, I had spoken with a gentleman who is a descendant, uh, long since dead now, this would have been in the early 80s, a fellow named Wilbur Pittenger was passing through town and with his wife, and he had to be in his late 80s at the time. Um, and he, uh, he and his wife were staying at the Traveler's Hotel, which was the only time I had ever been upstairs in the Traveler's. But they invited me down to talk about family history. And he was telling me about that there was a clay chute that was built from the valley up to the top of the hill. And that was how they got the clay from the mine area down to the pottery where they would mix it and wedge it and dry it out and have it ready for use. So that that uh, chute appears in this. And if you want to walk through the, uh, the, the hallway here and look at the blown up version of the 1886 bird's eye view map, you will see a very nice representation of that wooden chute that was used. And uh, according to Wilbur, the, the neighborhood kids used to slide down that because um, it was covered with clay. <laughs> I'm sure that made it made them popular with mother. Um, but anyway, just bits and pieces of things. Um, the pottery started out uh, with all wooden buildings. Uh, there was a major fire in uh, 1888, I believe, uh, that, that destroyed a lot of the plant, and they vowed that they would rebuild. And this photograph, which um, I don't know that I've ever seen the original photograph of this, but it's been copied many, many times. Uh, this shows the building that they constructed to take the place of the ones that had burned. And uh, it lasted actually quite a long time, uh, long after the pottery had ceased operating. But the, uh, the story that, um, that my grandparents always told me is that the gentleman sitting in the open window at the top of the gable here is none other than Stephen Moore. They didn't, uh, they didn't know if Mr. McDevitt was in the picture or not, but uh, it was a very substantial stone building that, according to the newspapers, was 25 by 105 feet, two stories. So not, not just a garage type operation. Um, and of course, adjacent, you, you don't realize that now, and you know, people who uh, don't remember much beyond the building of Route 11 wouldn't know about it at all, but there was a very substantial little creek that ran down through the valley called Carpenter's Run. And uh, I have found uh, two photographs of a, of a noted part of that, which was a little waterfall uh, located about where the pottery was and uh, appropriately was called Moore's Falls. Long since buried or destroyed. And this, um, see I don't, I don't have these on slides, so that's, that's probably a good thing. This is from one of the uh, Sanborn maps of the area. In fact, this is from a 1903 Sanborn map and it shows the pottery, it shows the uh, 
you can tell the material of the building, the, the blue portions, that would indicate a stone building. So that's going to be the one that was under construction in that other photo. Um, and then everything else, um, the, the two kills, this was never larger than a two kill pottery, one, one regular kill and a gloss kill um, are in red because they were made of brick. Doesn't show, well it does show the chute. Actually, it does show the, an outline of where it ran. Um, in fact, when I first got interested in this, I had pictures of Stephen Moore and his wife because the family had kept them. What I didn't have um, were pictures of the McDevitts and have since been able to copy those from glass slides, glass negatives. Uh, so we have the picture of Edward McDevitt and his wife, who I always describe people like this as his clearly unamused wife. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and according to my grandmother, who would, be speak, would have been speaking without first-hand knowledge, uh, she claimed that, that Stephen and Edward got along well enough to, to operate the business, but after McDevitt passed on, Mrs. McDevitt initiated litigation, which was the death knell of, of the, uh, the operation. So, um, McDevitt died in 1896, and I think I mentioned earlier, Stephen died three years later. Uh, they had lots of children. I, I don't think the McDevitts had quite as many as, uh, I know there was a daughter and at least one son. I've, I'm not aware of any descendants still in the area. Um, but of course, uh, as far as the Moors were concerned, um, there were two sons that lived to adulthood and three daughters of Stephen and his wife Elizabeth, also from Burslem. Um, and just as a, going through the old family photos, I found out that uh, each of the three daughters had a son who went off with the American Expeditionary Force. So Elizabeth Moore had married a, a, a John Brooks and their son Charles was my grandfather. We've got him. Uh, then uh, uh, Jenny Moore uh, married a Pittenger and uh, their son Edgar uh, was a World War I veteran. And the other daughter married a gentleman named Leonard. And uh, uh, that's probably the, the branch of the family I know the least about, because I don't think any of them are still around. Uh, but uh, the pottery was, was photographed much more frequently after it closed than it was ever photographed while it was in operation. And I, I seem to be finding more and more pictures of it as the years go by. Um, this is a kind of a foggy version of, of the shutdown pottery. If it was still standing, I'm sure we could do ghost tours of it. But uh, uh, again, showing it. And then uh, eventually the uh, kill sheds were demolished or stolen or burned down so that we had... Uh, uh, the two surviving kills. Uh, the, this photo is dated 1922, and I believe Harold Barth had something to do with this. Um, they were, uh, I think they were making plans even then to demolish the rest of the buildings. Uh, the area was also crossed by uh, the Wyano Railroad. Too late to do the pottery any good, certainly. Uh, but, but an interurban, and you can, uh, to some extent, you can still follow the, the route of the Y&O as you come down through California Hollow. Um, and somebody here might know more details on this, but I've asked, and other people have asked, how in the name did they get the name California Hollow? And uh, it's been suggested to me that that was done because the pottery was so far away from the business area then it might as well have been in California. And, it, and again, it's, it's consistent, if not provable, that that's how they named Klondike as well, when it began to, to uh, be the home of various potteries and subdivisions. Uh, you know, people say, well, 
move up there, I might as well move to the Klondike in, in Alaska. Um, so both of those names have survived. And uh, the building lasted, I think it was gone by 1930, the last remnants of the, the building uh, were, were demolished. And uh, of course, in the early 60s, uh, that portion of the valley was completely obliterated uh, by the construction of Route 11. And of course, the clever engineers at the time managed to cut away the support of the hillside so that it had been coming down ever since. In fact, I just had a call this week from an attorney uh, representing ODOT. Uh, my father still owns some acreage up on top of the hill and I said well you can always you don't have to go up there to maintain it just stand around it'll come sliding by any day. <laughs> and uh, he said well I'll give it to you. I said I don't want it. But uh, I think I've convinced ODOT to take all that's left uh, and, and that will bring an end to the um, any ownership connections with the site of the pottery. Um, and again, I, I think there were probably a, a, I bet there were probably a dozen or more potteries in, in East Liverpool that would have similar stories, you know, starting out in the years after the Civil War, doing some amount of business, doing fairly well, and then eventually just not, uh, not being able to, to, to grow to the to the higher level, of course, as, as we all know, some of the some of the large potteries failed abjectly uh, uh, when when times changed. Uh, there was a uh, a neat article. How am I doing time? I I told Linda to give me a clever mark if I go too long. It's like this. So twelve thirty. Oh, okay. Um, in 1942, uh, the review. Uh, interviewed an elderly gentleman named Bozen, John Bozen, uh, who had the distinction of having spent 63 years in the pottery industry in East Liverpool. And that when he was a boy of 10 or 12, his first job was at the McDevitt and Moore Pottery. And he said that to mix the clay, they did not have, at least initially, and I don't know that they ever did, uh, mechanical or steam equipment, they used a horse. And the horse would, would be tethered and walk around in a circle and somehow that, uh, that helped them mix the clay. Um, and he says that um, he started there as a water boy, a clay wedger, a coal hauler, and a fire tender. So definitely a, 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 an entry level position. And uh, it said that those memories were vivid in his memory. Um, he said the California pottery was about the size of a two-story frame house. Um, and he, he said there's as much difference between a modern pottery and uh, McDevitt and Moore that I worked in as a boy between a big barn and a pigsty. <laughs> so um, apparently uh, said the employees would have to walk through mud to get there. They had to drink water out of Carpenter's Run. Uh, they had to supply their own lighting source, either candles or uh, oil lamps. There was no natural light in the building. And uh, said they would, uh, they would mix the slip with the aid of the horse, um, and then they, they had a brick trough uh, that they would put the mixture in, boil it until a lot of the water had evaporated, and then they would take the uh, clay, knead it to get the air bubbles out of it, and then put it in the basement so they would make enough clay to last all winter uh, when the pottery was, was underway. Um, and uh, again, a, a story that was probably repeated dozens and dozens of times by people who got their start in the potteries and, uh, and stayed there. Um, I, I think I mentioned that there was a fire um, that, that, caused, that led to the building of the, the large stone two-story building. Uh, no sooner had that been completed in, in either 1891 or 1892, there was a second fire in 1893. 
and that particular fire uh, burned down all the frame buildings. So that would have been the uh, uh, clay making area and the uh, everything but the stone building burned. And uh, it said the damage was estimated at $12,000. Uh, they had insurance on the new stone building, but the insurance company had refused to cover the frame building. So that was just a loss and a, a staggering loss for a firm of that size. Um, in the 1876 article, it mentioned that uh, McDevitt and Moore could produce 700 packages annually. Now, I don't know, maybe you guys do, what's in a package. It has to be some specific amount of wear. But uh, by 1890, they were up to 1,000 packages per year. So slow but steady growth up, up to the point that the fires uh, kind of did them in. And uh, that's, uh, that's probably all I have to, <coughs> so I'm, a, I'm at a loss, I can't just make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, but, they never made whiteware then? They, never. Okay. Never. And no. they, did they do their own decorating? It's, yes. Those are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Everything was done locally. I mean, you know, I suppose the guy that shoveled clay down the chute wasn't the guy doing the decorating. But, um, you know, it's pretty sophisticated. It was it's done. And, and, uh, Stephen Moore's house is still standing, although, oh, it's further out California Hollow. Okay. It, it, <laughs> I, I would kind of love to see it in, in it, but I don't want to. It's, it's, yeah. it's out beyond the marijuana dispensary. Uh, the McDevitts lived, um, I believe, where that uh, uh, facility is. They were somebody was going to have cars towed there, and uh, they got special permission from one of the city departments to do so, and then never did a thing with it. But there's an, an older house there, and I believe that may have been the McDevitt home. Uh, but Mac I just found out this week, because I thought, well, what if somebody asked me what happened to McDevitt or where he's buried? And I did find out that he is in uh, St. Aloysius Cemetery. So, and uh, Stephen is up in Riverview, although currently under, without a military marker. So, we'll see what we can do with that. Um, but I would glad to, be glad to answer any other questions that anyone might have. You said the Pittengers were related to the Moore? Yes, one of the Moore daughters married a Pittenger. You, you ready for some scary news? Yeah. We can be related in a very, <laughs> in a very distant <laughs> way. Linda, get, get the arsenic. I'm scared. I'm get the arsenic and the sharp knife. I don't want to take any chances. The Pittengers are related to the hills from uh, what was Fairview, later New Manchester, now New really? Manchester. Okay. That's Pew Town. Oh. And uh, actually, I dated a Pittenger when I was in oh, high school. Oh, of course you, of course you. Mr. Cousins, Hales you know. is, uh, is a half of the Pittenger. Uh, yeah, John here. Did, did you mention that your your grandfather was the brother to Steve's grandmother? I did, Brooks. no, but that's that's the, the connection. Are all, yeah, Alice oh. Brooks Cooper. Right, all yeah, one, uh, my, my poor grandfather had five sisters, what? and he was the only boy. <laughs> and uh, so one of the sisters married Leander Cooper, as I recall, Lee Cooper, and then all the Coopers result from that. And uh, then uh, one of the daughters married a Pittenger, and one of them married a Leonard. Uh, the t there were two sons who lived to adulthood, uh, one named Alfred and one named John, and I was told by someone that uh, one of them was a hopeless alcoholic, but I won't identify who because I don't know that for sure. But they both lived uh, to be in their late 40s, early 50s. Uh, uh, Stephen Moore, that when he died, the, uh, uh, they got it wrong. They said that, that uh, he was an old soldier, which he was in for less than a year. I don't know how that makes you an old soldier. but. Uh, said that he had gone off to war with Colonel Vaudry's National Guard. Uh, absolutely not true. Um, but one thing that was true is that they said that he had died from the effects of Potter's asthma, which is silicosis, 
And incidentally, <laughs> Stephen Moore's father in England, also named Stephen Moore, died at age 45 of Potter's asthma. So it was a it was a tough life for these these folks. And. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm still stuck on the clay thing. So it was they always used a red clay. They didn't use the yellow. Well, they they clay? used whatever they could dig out of okay. the hillside. So, but I've yeah. I've never found anything to suggest that they you know imported or mixed yes, or okay. anything. Just just dug it out of the hill and, and mixed it and uh, with the water and and then went through. And I, every one of these pieces shows red. And uh, and you'd never guess that from looking at it here. Right? No. Yeah. Does it look? No, I think uh, I have a, a disproportionate number of these with the black glaze on them, yeah. and I think that was from the, the, the very <laughs> the very end of, of the production. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's um, I do have a cup or two cups that had been joined together as, as like a potter's whimsy, um, and and then a slot cut in them for a coin bank. Oh, okay. And uh, and they're done in a Rockingham finish. So there there are Rockingham pieces, and of course the museum has a beautiful platter of uh, it's one of the first commemorative plates, and it was a commemorative plate in Majolica uh, for the assassination of uh, James Garfield. So fairly early. Uh, but yes. So you're saying where the <coughs> slide is on Dresden Avenue now, that's the clay that was used? Yes. Okay. Right in that area. You know, I mean, 100 feet one way or the other. But and is it that the furthest pottery out? Yeah. Well, Sprucefell pottery was, yeah. was a lot further out, but uh, usually that gets eliminated from the, the list of Liverpool little, yeah. potteries. It's mm -hmm. the furthest on our map. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I say, it, you, you see it, um, we have one of those maps down at the Thompson House, and I always point that out, and, you know, people want to go see the, the ruins, that's why it's going to be a little difficult, because they're, they're gone and they're buried, so that's, that's as far gone yeah. as you can get. Yes, sir? Have you been there since someone dug up the foundations of the kills out there for a master's thesis, but the bricks are molded together from for, the heat. For where? The, yeah, for Bruceville. Oh, I've been out there, yeah. Yeah, I, I, a group of people went out there, oh, about a year ago in very cold weather. Um, and uh, I had been there one time previously with Dick Thompson. Mm -hmm. And that was, Dick was uh, really yeah. quite the scholar about the Spruceville pottery and had a lot of material that he had collected. And unfortunately that stuff was in his son's possession and uh, was in a, a rented property that burned to the ground along with all of, all of Dick's artifacts, his records, and all that. So that's, that's The one piece that you mentioned that's going to be in shows, uh, that's a piece of Majolica that uh, they made with Dick Moore. And it's going to be in a show in Baltimore in April. And it's going to be a show in Manhattan in September. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to get shows in Dallas and Cincinnati and also Stoke on Prince Capture, our sister city. Okay. So that's a, a fairly prominent piece that's managed to. Yeah, that, that whole circuit. thing is, is just about Majolica worldwide, isn't right. it? Right. And on uh, both sides of the Atlantic. Both sides yeah. of the Atlantic. So. Including uh, McDivitt Moore and uh, Globe. And uh, KTK and uh, Morley, mm -hmm. George Morley. Right. So I, I, you know, one of the, I, I've said for 45 years now, I, I wish somebody had a picture of Stephen Moore wearing his uniform, <coughs> but apparently nobody does. So the, the thought is still out there. But if anybody wants pictures of the, uh, de the abandoned uh, pottery building, we've got those to spare. And, uh, uh, just found another photograph of Moore's Falls this past year. So it's, again, the clearinghouse effect. You, you find somebody that, that's interested and they just hoard this, collect this stuff, although I think I share it. And, so uh, what, where was the falls? I'm having trouble getting this. Well, one of the things that confused 
devil out of me when I was younger, um, is that what we now know as Dresden yes. didn't exist. What we call Trentvale Street was Dresden. So there was no, where you turn and, and go down and around, they had to buy the land for that in about 1930. And uh, I know my great grandfather got a check uh, because they, they took part of his tennis courts uh, for the roadway. And that road was finished about 1930. So between, between Route 30 and the Wyano Road and Route 11, they have played hell with the geography of California Hall. Yeah. Um, well, that helps me. Yeah, yeah. I'm having trouble getting it straight in my head. Yeah. Yeah. And, Coming uh, down McKee Street, if you're on Route 11 and you look over, there's a big, yeah. um, so, or a big pipe like thing, and the water really comes out of there. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if maybe the falls could have been around in that area. It, it would have been uh, uh, just beyond McKee Street where, okay. where it dropped down hill. Like between 11 and Dresden now, there, there's a little creek that comes down. Oh, it's still there, but most yeah. of it is culverted. You know, it's 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 in a big pipe, and uh, you know, I I don't know whether there's. Because I know that the cemetery out in Calcutta, you can see it, mm -hmm. and then it goes down along between Columbia and Dresden. Right, yeah. right, but it's you know, so much of it is is not visible to the naked eye. It's still down underground, but uh, but difficult to see. So. If any of you want to look at that map here, it's in this, this uh, what we call the tunnel, through here. And it's not hard to spot because it's the highest one on the map. Right. Yeah. And we, uh, we let children put post-its on the bottle kills on there when they have a tour. And I always use that one as an example because if I don't, they're leaping trying to reach it all. Oh. <laughs> so I always say, I'll do this one. Yeah. Very <laughs> clever. Very clever. So, again, I'll... Uh, if there's anything, I'll... Well, thank you, Tim. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks very much. I encourage you to look at his photographs, ask more questions. So, thank you for coming.